and grew up believing in fairies. As a child, I would explore Central Park looking for fairy secrets, feeling guided by the mystery of the natural world around me. I'd collect bits of bone, stone, and dead bugs usually, and bring them to my parents' friends who worked at the Natural History Museum across the street. There, they would analyze them and explain to me what kind of rock I had found or what kind of animal part, and showed me how I could tell. This is what kept me coming back for more. They showed me how I could uncover these secrets myself. I fully believed that I was learning magic, and my parents encouraged this view as they taught me how to sing, dance, and sculpt, and made sure that the museum was always there at my disposal to answer all of my questions about the magical world of nature, which I would also come to call by another beloved word, science. One of the most incredible things that one can feel is a sense of wonder. Rachel Carson echoes this in a lot of her writings about the importance of wonder in education and science. She posits that the sense of enchantment we feel as children as we experience the world around us is the most important thing in education and thus in one life. I've tried to keep this sense with me as I've gone on my career through science research and my work as an artist, which are usually not mutually exclusive. I have to say, though, that one of the biggest challenges was that after being homeschooled for all of high school and a lot of uh, lower school, um, I couldn't always maintain this sense of wonder and excitement once I got to college. My biggest challenge was incorporating all of my interests and passions together and trying to find the already connected wonder I felt with art and science. But the overall structure of the liberal arts system isn't always conducive to this kind of endeavor. These challenges and my thoughts on them led me to give a TEDx talk at Hunter last year about interdisciplinarity. In that talk, I basically explained that in our pursuit of integrating disciplines, it is far better to use the inherent connections between things that already exist instead of building artificial bridges and ignoring the system's approach to reality. It is widely accepted that reality exists as a system, but it is not widely popularized as an idea that people actually use, even though we think interdisciplinary is a pretty good idea. One of the people that developed this idea is Buckminster Fuller who's a scientist and artist himself, famous for advances in math, engineering, chemistry, and even urban planning and social reform. This idea is also the basis for ecology, as an example, in which every element in a system affects every other element. One of the reasons, I think, that this approach to reality, even though it's scientifically valid, isn't so popular today is because our idea of interconnectedness is pretty much more associated with more hand-wavy ideas um, that are ungrounded in spirituality and myth and mysticism. However, if you look at spirituality and myth in a more evolutionary and anthropological way, you can see that these enchanted views of reality kind of seem like an early form of empiricism that predates modern science. David Abram, an anthropologist who wrote Spell of the Sensuous, describes an experience he had in Bali with, um, as he was living with natives in a local estate. He noticed that one of the women would leave rice platters out in the corners of the home. And when asked, she explained that this was an offering to the spirits of the house. Noticing that the rice would disappear at the end of the day, he watched the next day to see where the rice had gone and noticed that a line of ants had formed and took the rice away grain by grain. Originally, he thought that this explained the natives being fooled into thinking that spirits had accepted their offering instead of the ants actually having taken it. But then he realized that they must have known that the ants were taking it. They'd been building their homes in ant territory for generations. And he also realized that this practice actually avoided ant infestation in their food stores by keeping the ants satiated at the periphery of their homes. What still confused him, though, was why they asserted that this offering was to the spirits of the home, even though they knew that the ants were taking them. As he came to a deeper understanding, he realized that these people viewed the ants as the spirits, and that they saw no separation between the spiritual and the natural phenomena. One of the obstacles to viewing spirituality and myth this way in our modern day is that we assume that these concepts are necessarily dualistic. When we think of spiritual beliefs or mythical figures, we see them as a separate material from nature, or supernatural, above nature. If you start to see these views as more anthropological as David Abram and other academics do, though, it becomes apparent that they're not actually separate materials nor above nature at all. 
they're the same, inclusive. Which brings us back to fairies. So when I say I believe in fairies, I do mean it. It has actually helped me heal from a lot of college burnout to feel confident that I actually do, but I don't believe in some weird, disproven many times, like alternative species of myth. Fairy, in many ways, embodies the mystery of the natural world. Even J.R.R. Tolkien, whose works are imbued with a deep sense of enchantment, discusses this view of fairy in his 1937 essay on fairy stories. Fairy contains many things besides elves and fays, besides dwarves, witches, trolls, giants, or dragons. It holds the seas, the sun, the moon, the sky, and the earth, and all things are, that are in it, tree and bird, water and stone, wine and bread, and ourselves, mortal men, when we are enchanted. When we think about the fairy realm, we usually see it as an alternate universe. But Tolkien describes in his essay that fairy is just a view of reality that is not alternate, but inclusive. This is the internal uh, structure of trabecular bone, and for me, this is where I see the fairy world, one of the ways. <coughs> in a rather brilliant essay, Robert Bringhurst, who's a linguist, describes the relationship between mythology and science. Basically, early peoples engaged in a rather sophisticated form of empiricism. They learned through observation of nature, they had trial and error experimentation, but instead of deducing their observations into general laws like we do today, they incorporated their knowledge into mythic structures that were passed down through their generations. They successfully intertwined the intuitive with the analytic and the wondrous with the empirical. Modern science today needs to take things out of context in order to analyze them more intensely in the lab or otherwise. And it's important to do this. But unless you put back your aided observations into the context of nature as a whole, you risk coming to abstract and inaccurate conclusions about the world. One of these such conclusions that has caused a lot of trouble is the idea that humans are separate from nature. This causes a feeling of isolation often and is what deep ecologists and eco-psychologists call alienation. This in no way is conducive to our feeling of belonging in the world, and it's wrong. And it's also caused a lot of issues in our modern day. Using these academic approaches can see spirituality and myth and interconnectedness as something that makes sense inside the same network that scientific investigation engages in. My agenda for today is to talk about re-enchanting science and notice the re. Science is our modern approach at understanding nature and the world around us. It has always inspired us, probably because we are a part of it. And almost every scientific uh, discovery and innovation throughout history has been made through inspiration and great passion, i.e. enchantment. One of the larger issues in modern science, however, is that it's mainly lost its romance, and it's very afraid of any human emotional involvement. Certainly, there have been mistakes made by human bias in the sciences, and there probably always will be. But this has actually led to an attitude that has stripped science of all of its enchantment, especially in the way that we teach it and communicate it to the public. This is not only damaging to science education and communication, but it's damaging to science itself. It means that we're not going to be able to make as real discoveries that fit into the actual natural world. It is not the pursuit of science that is romantic, as is depicted in a lot of Hollywood franchises and TV shows that get it really wrong. It's the science itself that is romantic. It is the nuance of developmental pathways, the patterning of bone in 3D space, the saga of random mutation and evolutionary adaptation throughout time. This is where the spirit world lies, for me and in general. It is in the space between atoms, or the aerodynamics of leaf movement as trees dance in the wind. Once we stop assuming the dichotomies and dualism of only more recent millennia, we can start to see the natural world and scientific pursuit as enchanted. One of the ways in which my friend and I have used these concepts is to create an initiative called Outward Mind, which acts as a hub for discussing the enchantment that one can feel with the whole world, through science, through art, through imagination, storytelling, etc. My message to all of you today is to basically take this view of reality, this enchanted view of reality, and use it in your work or in your lives, whether you're an artist, a scientist, or anything else. This is how we should feel since the entire world is our home and it is where we belong. Thank you.